Sallam said it clearly that when a person who takes a slave, a free man or woman for that matter, a free person, and take him in slavery will never have the smell of paradise. So look at the approach that Islam took. Many people say, but why didn't the Quran have the final part of this? Why didn't the Quran come with final verse like drinking? Drinking was gradual. Why is it that there is no final verse in the Quran that says, all right, no more slavery, it's illegal, period. There is a good answer to that. The case of drinking is different. You can be detoxified from drugs or drinking in a span of a few years. And we all know that the laws of Islam, including laws about slavery and other things, were not revealed in most of the life of the Prophet ﷺ. Most of his mission, 13 years in Mecca, there was no laws because Muslims were small number in number and persecuted. When they went to Medina, the first few years were years of struggle to survive because they were attacked in one after the other by the pagan Arabs. So the completion of the laws or the tashari'ah was only limited to the remaining few years of the life of the Prophet. These few years were enough to get people de detoxified from booze and drugs and all of that, but it was not enough for such a deep-rooted institution like slavery that you can just overnight you do it. And you know what happened in America when somebody tried to do it immediately and bluntly? Lincoln, what happened? Hmm? A civil war and people, some slaves even were just thrown free without being prepared even to be independent. So it, it, it was actually set back in one sense. And some of the slaves have to go back and beg their masters to take them. But Islam provided this opening. The Prophet died before that. But if people and Muslims honestly followed that approach, that spirit of the Quran, it could have disappeared. But for some Muslims later to engage in slave trade or doing anything today that's contrary to the teaching of the Quran, say, oh, but there is no ultimate prohibition. It is disregarding the spirit of, of the law. Forgive me for the answer again, because that question is a very, uh, th that's a toughie. So that's why I had to spend time. Uh, the, uh, a less toughie questions, I'll go quick on it. Okay, you want to uh, rotate? For, oh, okay, no problem. The question is, um, people say that wearing pants is haram. Is it or is it not? There is no text in the Quran and Hadith that directly say that pants in themselves are haram. But the code of dress, which by the way apply to both male and female, is to avoid something that's overly tight, and especially in the case of females in particular, because of course, obvious gender differences that require more cover from a female than a male, which is obvious reasons. Uh, but what is um, what we need to keep in mind are two things. First of all, does the pants, for example, take the jeans, provide enough uh, cover and modesty for women? And the answer, obviously, no. It reveals everything and shows the shape of the body. And I would say even while there might be slight relaxation in the case of male, even overly tight pants or genes for males also would not be an appropriate thing to do. So also some basic uh, commonality in terms of modesty here. However, if, for example, uh, a, a sister is wearing loose pants, not something that describes the shape of the leg, and then she has a blouse that goes, you know, maybe to the knees, and find that this is more convenient and easy for riding buses and moving around, so long as it meets those requirements, then there is no reason to say it's haram. The second point, some scholars say no, but there is a hadith of the Prophet ﷺ that condemned those men who imitate women and women who imitate men. But again, that hadith speaks about basic cultural practices. Of course, there are certain areas that you know for sure that people are imitating women. If a man goes with earrings and uh, all this sort of stuff, you know, obviously, it's something that is for long centuries in history of humanity is known to be characteristic of women. That would be bad. Or if a man uh, wears a skirt or something and starts shaking around, you know. This, uh, <laughs> so that these things are really uh, are really obvious. But but to say that pants, if they meet the Islamic, you see, the Hadith did not say pants or dresses. The Hadith didn't say that. And even the ayah in the Quran that speak about garment has been interpreted as a requirement or desirable. There are differing opinions on that. But what I'm saying basically, that how can we say pants in themselves are haram? In Pakistan, and in the uh, Indian 
subcontinent in general, Indo-Pakistani subcontinent. For, for generations, some Pakistani sisters who are observant of the main parameters, Islam doesn't say design, parameters of Islamic dress, have been using what they call it the, what, the sharwal, which is loose, loose pants, but they have also the blouse that goes to, to their knees. In, in a situation like that, you cannot say that they are imitating men because they have a distinct design. It me if it meets the Sharia requirement, there is no harm of using this. Having said that much, having said that much, because I want to be very careful, not just using the term haram, haram, loosely like this, I must say that there is no question in my mind that a loose dress or jilbab is the best, for it conceals. It's beautiful, it's graceful, but in the meantime, it conceals you know, the beauty of the woman's body much better, perhaps, even than a, a pants and a blouse, even though it could be like a minimum requirement if it's loose enough for that purpose. Okay? Okay. My grandparents are Christian, and they celebrate Christmas. <coughs> My grandparents are Christian, and they celebrate Christmas. They know that I am a Muslim, and I do not celebrate Christmas. But they still give me gifts and invite my family over for dinner. I accept their gift because of what they believe in. So what does Islam say about this? I cannot pretend to speak on behalf of Islam, but I say my humble understanding of Islam is, or the teaching of Islam is based on the Quran and the Quran makes it clear that if you have parents who are not Muslims, the only way or situation you, you don't obey them is when they try to dissuade you from your, your faith and return you back to shirk that they used to believe in. But then the same ayah in the Quran says وَصَاحِبْهُمَا فِي الدُّنْيَا مَعْرُوفَ that you should deal with them in kindness in this life. And they have been evidence also from hadith of the Prophet ﷺ when a woman asked him, you know, my mother is a jahili, was even a pagan, idol worshipper, and she visits me. Should I accept her? Open my door. She says, yes, tabarriha, deal with her kindly, given her whatever you want, no problem. So kindness to parents, even who are not Muslims, is still required, even though you don't agree with their particular belief. Now, the question arises then with Christmas. The answer here must be, must take into consideration the situation we live here in North America, not just to get a ready-made fatwa that was meant for people living in a Muslim country. Obviously, if as a Muslim, somebody is inviting me uh, to Christmas party, it would be desirable not to go really because that's not my celebration. But when it's your own parents and it is part of your kindness to your parents, then there is no harm of accepting that but not to participate in something strictly prohibited. For example, religious service uh, that uh, involves shirk, I don't have to be in that. Uh, if they're drinking, you just say, all right, tell them uh, I am your son, I am your daughter. But I'd appreciate, I'm, I don't mind coming to have Christmas dinner with you. This is basically a social function. But please no drink because my religion doesn't allow me to sit on a table where, uh, you know, wine. And definitely parents love their children, even though they became Muslim. And probably they, I heard many cases they accommodate them, but tell them not, not to have any pork. This is an opinion only by exception to those whose families are not Muslims because if they don't, and you see that Christmas now is no longer really a religious celebration, is it? It became more like a family reunion, the children coming from various parts. And it would be rude and inappropriate and counterproductive for da'wah to say to per your parents, you go to H, I'm not going to be any part of this. So by exception, I think we should keep that in mind. There was a sister raising her hand in the back here. I don't know whether it might be a rejoinder on the question. Should we give her a chance? Because she was raising her hand for some time. The question of uh, piercing the body and abdomen and somewhere else, that sometimes it happens. Well, no, it's, um, I would say, uh, f the uh, piercing which is commonly understood to be part of uh, uh, historical uh, adornment of women, like uh, women piercing their ears for uh, earrings or anything of that nature, that's fine. But quite frankly, I can't see what is, what is the need for men to do that because, again, we mentioned the hadith about uh, men emulating something which is basically and exclusively known to be women kind of adornment. Secondly, the Prophet ﷺ taught us also not to be uh, copycats. 
you know, whenever somebody